Father, you are holy, holy, holy. And yet you come down to us and accept sinners, not on our works or what we have done, but because Christ had suffered for us. By the cross, we are forgiven. And by the life of Christ, we have a righteousness that is not our own, Lord. We are saints, counted righteous, forgiven, accepted. Lord, by your Holy Spirit, will you conform us to Christ this day? Comfort us by your fatherly arms. Convict us of our sin that we may run to Christ where all righteousness and forgiveness can be found. So Lord, we come to you in the righteous robes of Christ this morning as we sing, as we praise, as we hear your word. Lord, come to us in Jesus' name, amen. We will be in Psalm 145. A song of praise of David. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. They shall speak of your might, of the might of your awesome deeds, and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth your fame, the fame of your abundant goodness, and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all and his mercy is over all that he has made. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless your name. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and kind in all his works. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food in due season. You opened your hand, you satisfied the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call on him. To all who call on him in truth, he fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. This is the word of the Lord. Pilgrim song to you this morning, knowing that we belong as citizens of heaven, but here we are, Lord. We're, we're on this earth. We are away from home, and that means we are so desperate for you. We are so dependent upon you. God, it, it, it's reality that often we find our hands empty. It's often that we look in ourselves and realize we don't have what it takes. We don't have what we need to survive, to make it in this life. And so we're joining our hearts together this morning to declare that that we praise you, we worship you, because you are a faithful God. You are a God who meets us in those places where we're empty. You meet, meet us down in the darkest valley. You care for us. You attend to us. You're, you're so great and so big, and yet you make your home down low with those who are contrite in heart, those who are humble, those who are broken before you. And so, Lord, we're just thankful that you're such a good father. Um, Lord, we, we want this morning, we want for our praise to just continue to swell. We want our hearts to just continue to get wrapped up in the worship of, of who you are. And so we're, we're turning to your word this morning, Lord, not to transition from our worship, but to continue in our worship. That you would use your word to stir us up, to love you, to stir us up, to see your greatness, to stir us up, to, to want to offer everything we have back to you. So God, we're asking that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would use your word in our hearts. You would stir us up to, to, to see your greatness, to see your beauty, to see your majesty. Draw us closer to your son, Jesus Christ, this morning. We want to see you. We want to know you. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated. As you're taking your seat, uh, two things. First of all, any of our kiddos who've been checked in, uh, they can head to the back now. 
Uh, and then I want to also invite you to open your Bible to Psalm 145. Psalm 145. Hey, if you're here this morning and you don't have a Bible and you'd like to have one, uh, there's a rack of Bibles in the back. Uh, you can have a Bible there in front of you. And if you don't own a Bible, uh, feel free to take one of those and, and keep it and, uh, and read it. Um, today, we begin the final series, the final series through our six-year-long journey in the Psalms. Uh, so if you've been around our church, yeah. If you've been around our church uh, for a couple years now, you know that six years ago, uh, we started in Psalm 1, and we did not preach consecutively every single week through the Psalms, but here we are six weeks later on Psalm 145, and there's only six Psalms left. Uh, these last six Psalms are kind of a group of Psalms that are an exclamation point on the end of the Psalter. Um, you're going to notice that there's this repetitive theme through these six Psalms where we praise God. We cry out hallelujah to him. But what you're also going to notice is that while each of these last six psalms seemingly have so much in common, that there's also going to be something unique about each one. Some way in which our worship, our praise, our lifting up of God intersects with our real lives. And this morning, as we heard Psalm 145, and as we look at uh, unpacking Psalm 145, here's what we're going to see. That this psalm makes a connection between, between our singing and our sharing. This psalm is going to show us that uh, what we worship about in God is what we witness to in God. What we praise about God is what we proclaim to others. Uh, I think we get this in, in our everyday life. We get this in our normal uh, arenas of life. You and I, we don't have a hard time talking about the things that we're excited about. We don't have a hard time uh, t talking to other people about the things that uh, light our fire. Uh, earlier this summer, Allie and I went on our anniversary trip, and we went uh, down to Savannah for a few days. And uh, I ate the best meal I have ever had in my life, hands down, no question about it. It was the best meal I've ever had in my life. Uh, we went. We had a good time. Uh, we enjoyed each other. But I came back excited to talk to people about this meal. Uh, th this meal was, was unforgettable. I can't even remember what I had for lunch yesterday. But I am happy to talk to you after the service about this meal because it was just, it was that amazing. It was that unbelievable. And that is very natural for us. That's very normal for us. We, no one has to twist our arm to talk about the things that excite us. No one has to twist our arm to, to explain to other people why we enjoy certain things. And so this morning as we look at Psalm 145, uh, what, what God is trying to do is trying to help us see how normal, natural, every day it can be for us to talk about Jesus to other people. That it doesn't have to be this thing that's excruciating. It doesn't have to be this thing that's embarrassing. It can be as easy as simply talking about the things we enjoy, talking about the things we love, talking about the things that excite us. Here's what we're not going to do this morning. Uh, we're not here for the Bible to beat us up because we haven't shared Jesus enough. Uh, we're not here to pull out our, our, the, the notches on our missional belt to see if we've measured up to the standard of sharing Christ enough this week. That's not what we're here to do. What we are here to do is allow Psalm 145 to show us just how great our God is so that his greatness would, would want to bubble up out of us into our proclamation to others, into sharing it with others, into telling other people why it is that we're so excited about our God. Uh, the, the kind of the summary verse, I think, of, the, of this psalm comes at the very end, um, Psalm 145, verse 21. Let me show you how David kind of, kind of expresses this, this theme, how he connects the two things together. His praise with his proclamation, right? His worship with his witness, his singing with his sharing. Verse 21 says, My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. See, see David's excited about God. He wants to worship God. He wants to praise God. But it's not just enough for him to praise God. It's not just enough. If this is who God really is, if this is the greatness of the God that he worships, it's not just enough for his mouth to declare it. He wants everybody to know why this God is so good. He wants everybody to be drawn in to enjoy and to worship this God with him. And so that's what we're going to be looking at this morning, how our singing then fuels our sharing, how our worship then propels us to witness, how our praise launches us out to proclaim this God that we're so excited about. So we're going to summarize Psalm 145 into five things which call us to sing and to share. First, this morning, the greatness of God calls us to sing and to share. The greatness of God calls us to sing and to share. 
Psalm 145, we'll, we'll read verses 1 through 3 again. These verses say, I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. Uh, typically in life, when we think about something that's great or someone that's great, we have in mind like a category of people or we sort of see everybody else and we just imagine that that person is kind of one step above everybody else, right? The great person is the person who's one notch above everybody else. Uh, but when it comes to God's greatness, that doesn't quite cut it. Like, for example, when we think about God's greatness, we think about his bigness. We think about how uh, large he must be. But it's not as if, you know, we're down here, little mini humans on the earth, and that up there in the sky is just a big giant who we worship, who, who's, who's about 10 times larger than we are, like a 10 times larger version of us than we are that, that we sing and praise. No, when we talk about God's bigness, his greatness, his largeness, we have to talk about these things in, in terms we don't even understand, like infinite, like eternal. Like if we were to try to measure God this way and measure God this way, we'd never find the end of him that way. We'd never find him the, the end of him this way. We'd never be able to see how uh, low his feet are, if you will, or never be able to find how, high, how, how tall his head is. He's immense. He's immeasurable. He's infinite. He's not just a slightly larger version than we are. He is uh, unimaginably, infinitely bigger. When we think about God's power, it's the same kind of thing. It's not just that God is kind of more powerful than anything we see. You know, we see these powerful hurricanes. We see the powerful ocean. Uh, we, we know what power is. And maybe in our minds we think, well, you know, God's power is just like a little bit more than, than whatever those powerful things are. But no, no, no. The Bible teaches us that God is all-powerful. Here's how all-powerful God is. I don't know what you think of when you think of all-powerful, but here's how all-powerful God is. Nothing exists. Nothing moves. Nothing happens. Nothing holds together without God's upholding power. Right now, every single thing in your body, every, the chair that you're sitting, the building that, that we're uh, hanging out in, none of it would be if God wasn't holding it up to be. His power is moment by moment fueling whatever other power we think even exists in the world to begin with. Guys, we can't even imagine God's greatness. But when we think about God's greatness, when we praise him for, for his greatness, what we're talking about is his bigness, his immensity, his largeness, the fact that he is in control. That's what we're celebrating when we think about God's greatness. So what's David want, wanting us to do? Well, well, he says a couple things here in these first few verses that help us understand how we're supposed to respond. For example, he says, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. So, so he's wanting us to almost imagine two scales. Uh, on the one side, he's, he's going to place the greatness of God. And here's what David's saying. He's saying, however great God is, that's how great our praise should be. So whatever, whatever the measure of God is, that should be the measure of how we praise him. He, in other words, you can't ever over-exaggerate praise when it comes to God. Listen, there's other things in life. You know, somebody comes up to you and they, they try. I, I did this actually to somebody recently. I way overdid something. Like I told, I, I told somebody about something in my life that I thought was awesome. They tried it and they said, eh, it was just okay. Uh, that stings a little bit, right? What David's trying to say is when it comes to God, we, we can't over-exaggerate. We can't make him sound too good. We can't give too much of ourselves to the praise and the worship of God. And then he says things like this, every day, every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. David's saying, if God's greatness goes on and on and on and on, like we can't find the end to his greatness, then it means we should praise him every day and then the day after that and then the day, the day after that and forever and ever and ever and ever. So uh, it's clear that God's greatness calls a great praise, a great praise out of us. And I think it, it should make sense to us why, if we find God's greatness so amazing, if, if we want to praise him and worship him for his greatness, then it makes sense why we want to share that with other people. Um, just just uh, right here, you can see it. It's kind of later in the passage where we're going to look at it, but in verse 6, after calling us to praise, David turns and he, and he says, I will declare your greatness. So yes, he's praising, but he's also proclaiming. He's singing, but he's also sharing. He's worshiping, but he's also witnessing. So when would be a time, when would be a moment, when would it be appropriate for us to share about the greatness of God? Well, I think the best way to get at this is to just turn it back around on ourselves. Why is it that it matters to us that God is great? Why do we need to know this unsearchable greatness of God? 
Well, here's why. When I finally grasp how great God is, that he's all-powerful, that he's in control, I can finally admit that I'm not in control. That the weight of the world is actually not on my shoulders. That I don't have to run around spinning all the plates in my life, making sure I'm the one holding the universe together. Guys, there's only one being in the universe that doesn't have boundaries. God is the only one who doesn't have to take a nap, who doesn't have to eat lunch, who doesn't have to exercise to stay healthy. God is the only one who can read every single article on the internet when they're trying to figure something out. God is the only one who can be God. And so we need to share the greatness of God with people who are weary in their life because they think it's all up to them. People who think that the weight of the world is on their shoulders. This is how Jesus kind of talks about this in Matthew chapter 6. He talks about how there are people in the world that because they don't believe in God, they actually have to go around worrying about what they'll eat, what they'll drink, what they'll wear. But he's saying, if we, if we believe in this God, if we believe in a great, all-powerful God, we don't actually have to worry about those things. We don't have to worry about what we're going to eat, what we're going to drink, what we're going to wear. So we move in to a weary, hurting, broken world that thinks they have to be their own God, and we give them the release of knowing there's actually a great, immense, all-powerful God who's the one holding all things together. So we sing about God's greatness, and then we share God's greatness. We worship him for his greatness, and then we, we witness to his greatness. Uh, the second thing this, this morning we see in this, uh, this psalm is that the works of God call us to sing and to share. The works of God call us to sing and to share. Verses 4 through 6 say, One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds and I will declare your greatness. Notice how in these first few verses, uh, in, in, in these few verses here, David mentions God's works, he mentions God's acts, and he mentions God's deeds. So in other words, it's true that we can look to God's sort of generic attributes like his greatness, and we can praise him for it, but we're really drawn in to see how God is great and how God loves us and how he is gracious when we, when we look at what he's done, like when we look at his resume, right? In this world, you and I, we're, we're sort of um, infatuated with this idea of a resume, I think they call it something else now. What is this CV thing? I don't even know. But apparently they changed the name of a resume or whatever it is. We care. Why do we care? We want to know what someone's done. We want to know what their worth is. We want to know what they bring to the table. And here David is saying, there is one whose fame outlasts them all. There is one whose track record, whose resume isn't on even the same planet as anyone else or anything else. When we think about these works, these amazing works of God, we can't help but first thing about creation right? We see God's might and power and wisdom in creation, both as we look up to the heavens and we see these vast, enormous uh, universe with the stars and the planets, and then it goes all the way down to the intricacies of the human body, like the eyeball, like the birth of a human, like the organs that keep us moving and living all day long. What we see as we think about God's work of creation, we see a masterful artist, we see someone who knocks the top off of our imagination with what is beautiful and what can take our breath away. But it's not just that God created the world, right? We also uh, praise God for his work of providence, that he's actually carrying history forward according to his purposes and according to his plan. Think about this, guys. Think about how many billions of people have lived and died. Listen, I can't even manage one day in my own life. And yet God is orchestrating billions and billions of people's stories together in a way that actually makes sense, in a way that actually leads to his purposes according to his plan. How wise must he be? How caring must he be? How powerful must he be to be able to weave billions of stories together intricately in a way that lead to his grand designs for what he created 
But I think that the thing that uh, stands out the most about God's works, right? We love, we love to think about God's works of creation. We love to think about his work of providence. But more than anything else, what screams God's glory and splendor more than anything else is his work of redemption. That God, seeing us in our sins, seeing us headed nowhere but towards death, sent his own son into this world, that the eternal son of God assumed our humanity, took on our flesh, came and lived, performed miracles that were unfathomable, was tempted in every way beyond what you and I could even imagine and stood up to that temptation and then willingly offered himself up for sinners on the cross. But then, as we've already prayed about this morning, as we've already sang about this morning, he didn't stay in the grave. God raised him up, the most mighty work of all. And it wasn't just that Jesus was conquering death. It was that God was launching a new creation. Now, if that's not enough, we have to think then about how that redemption intersects with our lives, right? When God came to you, how did he find you? Did he find you with an inclination towards righteousness? Did he find you with a heart that was full of goodness and love and compassion for him and for others? No, when God found us, he found us dead. He found us running in the opposite direction. He found us having no desire to want to do what was right, but only a desire, only a desire to want to break the rules and break his law and, and do whatever he said that we shouldn't do. And it was right there in our deadness that he performed a miracle and he raised our hearts to life with Christ forever and ever. That is the greatest work of all. To take a dead heart and bring it back to life. So we celebrate, yes, we celebrate God for his, his general attributes, his greatness, his love, his, his grace and that sort of thing. But it's when we see his resume, it's when we see his track record, it's when we see his works that we know he is the greatest. He is worthy of all praise. He's worthy of, of the fame that he deserves. And uh, it, it makes sense, right, that if we love his works, if, if we have found our life in his works, then we should get excited about sharing those, those works with others. I love here in this psalm how uh, David paints for us a kind of generational vision in verse 4 there where he says, one generation shall commend your works to another and shall decree your mighty acts. Um, I love that, that, that David uses that word, commend, commend. Um, in our day and age, we have something that's called a letter of recommendation, right? A letter of recommendation. It's where you are supposed to write a letter about someone else to someone else to try to tell them why they should accept you or why they should like you or why they should hire you and that sort of thing. Um, I heard somebody uh, talking about this the other day, and they were saying they asked somebody to <laughs> write them a, a letter of recommendation, and when the person brought it back to them, they handed them and said, hey, by the way, I just want you to know, I used AI to create this recommendation letter and just put your name at the top. So I hope you're all right with that. So I'm not really sure what good a recommendation letter is in the world of, of chat GPT. But the point of a letter of recommendation is to show someone why they should care. Show, show someone else why you believe that person's trustworthy, praiseworthy, why they have qualities that, that, that you think they ought to care about. And what David is saying here is he's saying, it is the privilege, it is the privilege of every generation to write a recommendation letter to the kids and the grandkids and those around them of why it is that we praise God, why it is that we trust God. It is our privilege to tell them with clarity, with passion, with excitement, why we have staked our life on this God who is faithful, why we praise him with all of our heart. That's our privilege, to get to commend our God to commend his works, to tell the story again and again and again. Here's the deal, guys. The question is not if we will commend something to the next generation or not. The question is what will we commend to the next generation? What will they see that we cared about most? What will they see that made us most passionate? What will they see that gripped us, that held us, that shaped us more than anything else? It's 
not a question of if we will commend something to the next generation. It's what will we commend to the next generation. Uh, maybe you're here this morning, you're a parent, a father, a mother, and this, this idea excites you. Uh, but maybe you feel like you need some resources. Well, just broadly, generally, um, there's, a ton, there's a ton of resources out there for parents to commend the wonderful works of God to the next generation. But, but the kind of the two simple ways that, that over the, the centuries that have, that have seen to work uh, ha, have been songs and stories. Right? There's endless songs, endless songs. Kids love songs. Kids love to sing. There are endless songs about God, about what he's done, about his marvelous works. So we teach our kids these songs, and then we tell our kids the stories. We read the stories of God. We read the wonderful works of God to our children. But here's the deal, guys. Um, whether we're parents or not, whether we have kids or we don't, commending the wonderful works of God to the next generation, it really isn't, it really isn't about the resources. The resources can be helpful. The resources can aid us. But ultimately, what it's going to be is what they saw us care about. What they saw in our, our passions, our values. What did we care about most? That's going to be the letter that you're writing to your kids, that you're writing to your grandkids, that you're writing to the, to the generations of people around you. And this is our privilege, guys. This is our privilege. Nobody else gets to do this. It's our privilege to commend the wonderful, wonderful works of God to the next generation. So, again, we, we sing and then we share. We praise and then we proclaim. We worship and then we witness. That leads third this morning to the fact that the goodness of God calls us to sing and to share. The goodness of God calls us to sing and to share. Verses 7 to 10 say, They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. Look, it's really important. It's really important for us to know that God is great. Uh, it's really important for us to know that God's all powerful. It's really important for us to know that God is in control. But if we only believe in a God who's great, if we only believe in a God who's all-powerful, if we only believe in a God who's in control, then that's actually a terrifying reality. What we need is to believe in a God who's not only great, but a God who's also good. Not just a God who's all-powerful, not just a God who is in control, but a God who's on our side. I mean, think about uh, in your life, you, you, the, the, the best friendships you've had. Your best friend, your best friend is not necessarily your most powerful friend. Your best friend is the friend who's good to you. The friend who sticks with you. The friend who is with you. The friend who's on your team. The friend who's by your side. That's your best friend. To only know the power of God, to only know the greatness, the bigness, the control of God without knowing that he's for us, that he's with us, that he's on our side, that's a terrifying thing. But when we know that not only is he great, not only is he big, not only is he all-powerful, not only is he in control, but that he's also for me, that he's also with me, that he's working all things for my good, that can change my life. That will tra transform everything. To know that this all-powerful, great, big God is also on my side. So if we worship God for his goodness, then it makes sense that we would want to share that with others. It makes sense why we would want to tell people that this God we love, the real God, he is actually slow to anger. That the real God is actually full of grace and mercy and steadfast love. Guys, in our world today, there are so many, there are so many who have hard thoughts of God. I can't tell you how many people I've met and they'll say to me, oh, I, I can't go to church. The, uh, the roof will fall in on me if I, if I walk in the door. 
what do, what, do, what do people mean when they say that? Oh, I can't show up there. The roof might fall in. What, what do they mean by that? Well, first of all, let's just be honest. They fail to realize that God is just as much outside the door as he is inside the door. You know what I mean? Like, if, if, the, roof, if the roof of the church is going to cave in on you, then the ground would have probably swallowed, swallowed you up already. But it's really not even, that's really not even the misunderstanding. It's that the view of God is that he's angry, that he's mean, that if I'm a sinner, there's, there's no way I can get close to this God because he'll, he'll strike me down. So guys, we have the privilege of, of getting to set the record straight. We have, have the privilege of getting to, getting to tell people, uh, I hate to break this to you, you're actually way worse than you think you are. And I'm probably way worse than you think I am. And the fact that the ground hasn't swallowed us up means that God's actually really kind. That he's actually slow to anger. And not to mention that we're still here and breathing and alive and able to enjoy food and people and all sorts of other things. But we also know that this God, he sent his son Jesus to the cross and the roof fell in on Jesus. The wrath of God fell on his own son. He is slow to anger. He is one who welcomes sinners. He is one who is not only powerful, not only big, not only sovereign, but he's a God who comes to our side, is willing to team up with us. He's for us. And I think this, this is where the idea of witness becomes uh, really important, right? This psalm, all throughout the psalm, it's, it's connecting the idea of our, our, our praise and our proclamation, our, our singing and our sharing, our worship and our witness. But the idea of witness, I think, is especially important because when we think of the idea of witness, it's yes, 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 we, we witness with our words. Yes, we talk about God. We, we, we verbally tell people about the greatness of our God, but we also witness to God with our lives, you know, I think sometimes the reason people have the view of God that if they walked in the church, the roof would fall in on them is because they've experienced that kind of treatment from, from people who go to churches. And so they think, if that's how the people in the church treat me, then that's probably how God thinks of me too. But it's our privilege to get to set the record straight that as we tell people about God's grace... We get to show them God's grace. As we tell people about God's forgiveness, we get to forgive the people who have wounded us. As we tell them about the God who's slow to anger, we get to show them what it looks like to be slow to anger, to wrap our arms around sinners, to even welcome people who have no good interest towards us in return. We worship this God, but then we witness to him, yes, with our words, but we also get to reflect his good heart. So we sing and we share, we worship and we witness. Fourth thing this morning is that the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God calls us to sing and to share. The kingdom of God calls us to sing and to share. We'll read verses 11 and the first half of verse 13. God's word says, They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. Again, David is he's trying to stir us up. He's trying to stir us up with all these reasons that we praise our God. He's been talking about God's attributes. He's been talking about God's works. And he turns now and he, he brings up God's kingdom. He says, yeah, here's, here's another precious jewel. Here's another one of those unsearchable riches of Christ that we get to enjoy. That we are citizens of God's kingdom. And uh, he, he highlights a couple things in these verses. I think the most obvious one is that being a part of God's kingdom means living under God's rule. It means as citizens of his kingdom, we actually love God's law. We love his ways. We, we've already thrown in, the, thrown in the towel. We've already waved the right flag, white flag. We've admitted that we can't figure life out on our own. And so we're glad that there's somebody who actually knows how life works, who's here to tell us how life really works. 
That's a good thing. We're excited about that. We are excited about King Jesus. We are glad to have a Lord over us. We, we have already said, I tried it my own way, and it did not go well. I'm happy to have one who knows exactly how humans flourish. Lead me, show me, guide me, help me. This is God's rule, God's dominion, God's reign, and we're excited about it. But I think the other thing that, that David draws us into is the fact that, that God's kingdom is everlasting. God's kingdom is eternal. Don't, don't you feel, don't you feel as you look around that this world is falling apart? Isn't that like pretty much the only thing that we all agree on? That something is terribly wrong and that the things that we keep looking to to protect us, to secure us, to keep us safe, to give us meaning, to give us a sense that we're going to last, that all of those things keep getting ripped away from us, that all the things that we thought we could trust, all the things that we thought we could find refuge in, they're falling down all around us. And so here David reminds us, he says, in the midst of this broken world, in the midst of everything falling apart, in the midst of a world where everything's going wrong, we belong to a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Our feet are planted on ground that won't be moved. That if we hitch our wagon to anything else in this life, then whatever we build will get torn down. But if we hitch our wagon to King Jesus, then we endure forever. We reign with him forever. And that's why we praise God for his kingdom. Yes, because Jesus is king, and yes, because our king is can't lose. No matter what happens in this world, no matter what happens in this life, if we are citizens of that kingdom, we belong to something that will last. And I think that we have uh, quite an opportunity uh, right now in, 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 in the world in which we find ourselves in. When, when will people ever care more about who's in charge? Think about it. Think about how much people care right now about who's in charge, about who's in leadership, about who's running things. Do we think people care about that? Clearly, we care very deeply because we know that whoever's in charge, whoever's at the top, it shapes our life. It means something for us. It means something for my wallet. It means something for my house. It means something for my kids. Who's in charge matters to us, and people care. And so what if we took this opportunity? Guys, it, it's not here all the time. It only comes every couple years. What if we took this opportunity to, 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 to do this, to say, hey, I know we've talked about uh, politics stuff. I know we've talked about November 5th. I know we've both kind of probably grumbled and complained a little bit about some things, but can I just ask you for a minute, like, have you ever thought about why you care so much? You ever thought about why it matters to you? Who runs things? Who's in charge? Who's, who's in leadership? Use that open door and then, and then maybe say, can I, just, can I tell you a little bit about why my hope is not in any earthly leader? Why my hope is in a king whose kingdom never ends? Listen, guys, those, those conversations are never easy. I know it never goes that smooth. But this is a moment this is an opportunity. There is a certain passion, a certain desire, a certain drive that is uniquely present that we can tap into, that we can use to show people that this world is falling apart and it's not going to stop. But we have our hope in a kingdom that lasts forever. And we follow a king whose justice is perfect. We follow a king who has a great housing plan. Excellent retirement. Endless inheritance. And that's where our hope is. So it makes sense, again, why we share what we sing. Why we proclaim the very things that we praise God for. And that leads finally this morning uh, to, to our uh, fifth and final thing. That the kindness of God 
calls us to sing and to share. The kindness of God calls us to sing and to share. The end of verse 13 and then through verse 20 says, The Lord is faithful in all his words and kind in all his works. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand. You satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. Um, Twice in this section, the word kind appears, but I think it's bigger than just these two words, these two appearances of the word. I think the description of what what David is, is showing us reveals God's kindness in ways that sometimes we miss. What David is uh, doing as he unpacks this section of the psalm is he's showing humanity in need. He shows us people who are falling, people who are bowed down, people who are hungry, people who are empty, people who needs, need saving. And even that last part of verse 20 is, is he's, he's actually encouraging people who need justice, people who feel like there's no one there to defend them. What David is painting is he's painting the picture of of our lives. That we're needy. That we're empty. That we're hungry. That we're helpless. That we need saving. And here's what what David's trying to teach us. That the real God, the true God, the, the God who's actually there, the God who exists, he's not a God who's stingy with his kindness because he's waiting on us to sort of figure things out before he would come to our aid. He's not a God who's sort of up there at the top of the mountain, we're down at the bottom, and maybe he'll come down to us if we're willing to meet him halfway. What David is is showing us is he's showing us a God who comes right down to us in the bottom of our pit, who meets us in our emptiness, who meets us when we've fallen, who meets us when we have nothing to bring to the table. The God who sees sinners who have no way to redeem themselves And so he comes down to us. He meets us in the low place. He finds us when we're helpless. And I think this is why the Apostle Paul says this about God's kindness. This is striking. In Romans chapter 2, verse 4, Paul actually says that it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. Now, if you were to think about repentance, if you were to think about this idea of turning back to God, of of leaving our sins behind and, and turning back to walk with God, and you were to put your finger on the one thing, the one button, the one trigger that would cause that, the one thing that would motivate people more than anything else to turn away from their sin, to turn away from running after their self and turn back to God. Paul says, if I just had to pick one thing, I would say it's God's kindness. It's that I've seen that no matter how far I run, he's already there with me. No matter how low I go, he'll meet me down in that place. That when I was a wretch, when I was lost, when I had nothing, he was willing to send his son into this world for me. And that's what melts the heart. That's what breaks the hard ground up. That's what draws us back to him. Because I realize I actually don't have to keep my distance from this God. I don't have to clean myself up first before coming to this God because he's right here. He's near. In him, we live and move and have our being. So if we love God's kindness, if we've experienced God's kindness, then we have the great privilege of showing others why why, why did we turn back? Why did we come to God? Why did we leave the old way behind and come to him? It's, it's because of his kind heart. Uh, this morning we've been talking about how it, bec- it can become normal and more natural and easier. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm saying it's easier to share Christ when we are passionate about Christ. 
that just like all the other things in our life, when we get excited about them, when we care about them, when we love them, when we enjoy them, we naturally want to share it. Nobody has to twist my arm to talk about the things I like. And what Psalm 145 is trying to do is it's trying to show us how when we get excited and passionate and we are soaked in the glories of God, then it becomes more normal and natural to talk about the glories of God. Um, here, here's kind of the picture um, that I want to leave you with. Um, we've all seen what happens when you take a bottle of soda, you shake it up, and you take the top off, right? What happens? Well, pfft, you know, it explodes. Sometimes it happens on accident, right? You, um, I'm sure, hopefully, I hope this has happened to you at one point in your life where you weren't expecting it. You open the top, pfft, you got a surprise. I hope that happened to you. Uh, whether it's on accident or on purpose, uh, we, 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 we know that there's something in there that it, it gets stirred up, and then when you take the top, it just can't help it. Pfft, just kind of blow, blow off the top. Um, here's the question I think that Psalm 145 begs us to ask. What's God's plan for shaking us up? What's God's plan for stirring us up? That sharing Him, that proclaiming Christ, that witnessing to Him would sort of bubble up out of our lives. What's God's plan? Here's what I fear. What I fear is that too many of us believe that what shakes us up is a guilt trip. That we've heard or said things like, if you really love those people, you would tell them about Jesus. Or, even more serious, I mean, if you're out there and you don't tell people about Jesus, can you even be a Christian at all? Is that how the Bible stirs us up to share? Is that how Jesus meets us to stir our witness of him? Guys, look from cover to cover in your, in your Bible. Here's what you won't see. You won't see someone being reprimanded and rebuked for not sharing Jesus more. You won't find it. Here's what you will find. Time and time and time again, Jesus taking our eyes off of ourselves and putting our eyes back on him so that as we see his grace and we see his goodness and we see his mercy and we see what he did for us at the cross, it bubbles up out of us naturally. Jesus knows. Guys, Jesus is really wise. He's a really smart guy. He knows that guilt can only get you so far. Guilt will only last for a minute. But there's something deeper. There's a motivation that's richer, fuller, longer lasting, more joy filled. And that is when we are overwhelmed with his glory. When we see his grace, when we fall down again at the foot of the cross, and then we want to go, we want to share, we want to tell people because we know it's changed our life. We know that in, in all reality, Jesus has become everything to us. And so this morning, we're going to take the Lord's Supper. And what I love about the Lord's Supper is that, guys, Jesus, he only gave us two ordinances. He only gave us two things that he wanted us to do. He wanted us to get baptized. And then again and again and again and again, he wanted us to come to his table and have our eyes taken off of ourselves and have our eyes put back on him. That when Jesus wants to nourish his people, when Jesus wants to encourage his people, when Jesus wants to motivate his people, he says, come, take my body, eat it, and come, take my blood and drink it. Because as the reality of my story, the story of the gospel, as it sinks in, as it grips your heart, you'll be nourished, you'll be filled, you'll swell, you'll be stirred, you'll be shaken up. You'll be shaken up. So here's what we're going to do uh, in a moment. Uh, I'm going to ask you to come forward and to take the elements, the bread and the cup. And then I'm going to ask you to go back to your seat. And we're actually going to sing together. We're going to worship Jesus together, holding the elements in our hands. And then we'll take the Lord's Supper together after we worship, after we sing. Uh, but I just want to say uh, this morning that if you're here and you're not a Christian, you would say you don't believe in Jesus, you haven't surrendered your life to Jesus, uh, this table, these elements are actually not for you. What I want to encourage you to do 
instead of coming forward to get the elements, I want to encourage you to sit in your seat and pray. Search your own heart. Ask yourself, can you see in Jesus Christ a kindness that would draw you to repentance, that would draw you to him? Here's the deal. If you're afraid that somebody else around you might judge you for not standing up, that's their problem. What's so more important, what's way more important than you just sort of getting up and going through the ritual and sort of being a part of the group, what's way more important this morning is that you actually do business with Jesus. That you take time to maybe, maybe this morning, open up to him in faith and say, Lord, save me. I call out to you. I cry out to you. I don't even know where to start. I don't even know how this works, but I need you, Lord. That is way more important than you coming up and just participating in this thing to go through the motions and, and feel like you fit in with the crowd. So if that's you this morning, I am going to be praying for you. Uh, I'm going to pray here, and then uh, those of you coming forward, you can stand up, come to the table, get the elements, and then uh, go back to your seat to worship together. Lord, I thank you that your word is powerful, that you have revealed yourself to us, and Lord, what we see in your word is an amazing vision of a God that is beyond our wildest dreams. Lord, help us this morning to be melted by your kindness. Help us to be shaken up by the truth of Jesus Christ and him crucified. Lord, help us to be shaken up by the reality that you are a, a father in heaven who loves us, who knows us, and who holds us in your hands. Lord, I pray right now that as we come to your table, you would nourish us. You would encourage us. You would motivate us as we feed on your son, Jesus Christ. We want our eyes to lift off of ourselves and to gaze upon our Lord this morning together. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Let's come forward.